It seems like all of the most iconic horror games are Japanese, but despite that, most of them seem to favor Western settings. Resident Evil and Silent Hill both take place in the United States, and the Clock Tower games, for the most part, take place in Europe. They may live in Japan, but they sure love their Western settings. But every now and then, you will find something taking place a little bit closer to home. Uh, their home, not mine. After departing the Silent Hill franchise, Keiichiro Toyama opted out of the American setting in favor of something closer to traditional Japanese horror with Siren on PlayStation 2. But he wouldn't be the first one to do so, oh no. Uh, horror games of the late 90s were lacking in Japanese settings, but he wasn't the one to change that. No, it would be Tecmo that stood up to the plate to create the PlayStation 2's first true survival horror game with a traditional Japanese story, setting, and characters. It would also offer ideas that, at the time, were completely brand new for the genre. Enter Fatal Frame. After years of making Ninja Gaiden and sports games, Tecmo would greenlight one of the PlayStation 2's earliest horror games. Makoto Shibata was the man behind it, who previously worked on Tecmo's Deception series, a series of strategy games on PS1 that were all about setting up traps in a castle to prevent intruders from reaching you. These games were praised for their inventive and thoroughly original gameplay, which was one of Fatal Frame's strengths as well. As the new hardware came in, they continued to innovate by incorporating gameplay that was once again unconventional while being simultaneously easy to grasp. In a 2013 interview, Makoto Shibata said that he had a special interest in the horror genre, stating, I tend to see things myself every now and then in real life. In other words, my experience of seeing things that weren't actually there or noticing abnormal things around me were some of the fear factors I thought would appeal to the emotional side of the player. With the PlayStation 2 launching with the DualShock 2, it would be possible to communicate subtle stimulation via haptic feedback into the player's hands, hence noticing things you cannot see. This seems to be that one horror franchise that's not Resident Evil or Silent Hill that everybody loves to talk about. You wouldn't believe the amount of people who've asked me about these games over the years, and I've been fairly curious about them myself. I've only ever played the first one at a friend's house for like half an hour one time years and years ago, so I'm still pretty dang blind on these things. And with that said, I'm fairly excited to finally crack into these games. Firstly, can we talk about that box art though? It is not very good. Uh, the Japanese and PAL covers looked way better. It was called Project Zero over there. What is with horror games having different titles in other regions? Biohazard, Demento, Forbidden Siren? I'm surprised Silent Hill wasn't called something different here. Okay, Fatal Frame. Based on a true story. Yeah, okay, bub, and so is Fargo. I hate to break it to you, but ghosts kind of aren't real, so... Myth busted. This is likely referring to Shibata's various paranormal encounters, but to claim it's based on a true story kind of implies the plot was based on a real series of events rather than the gameplay being inspired by the developer's own experiences. I noticed that the Japanese and PAL versions don't have that subtitle, so I imagine this was probably a silly thing added by the American localizers in an attempt to better sell the game or something. The very first line of the game puts us in the shoes of two Japanese teens, Miku and Mafuyu. After their mother passed away, they only had each other, and since they're seemingly the only ones that have these paranormal experiences, they're also the only ones they can talk to about it. So it's a pretty big sting when Mafuyu goes missing one day. He set off to Himuro Mansion in search of a novelist that also went missing, searching the mansion as research for his latest work. Though, of course, during his search, he also kind of goes missing. It's been two weeks since I last heard from my brother, but he left a note that led me to this place. Oh man, that voice acting, that is... So this is Himuro Mansion. That is not good. It's not like uncanny weird performance that some people could argue adds to the game. No, I, I think this is just flat out weak. I wonder how long it's been since my brother and I began to see things other people can't see. I have to speak slowly and enunciate every single last syllable. Come on, what is this? It's like, it's like schoolgirl chills. Number 15, Burger King Foot Lettuce. 
We play through the prologue as Mafuyu as a sort of quick flashback, everything being in black and white, it's pretty much the game's tutorial. We learn the basics like exploring and combat with ghosts and whatnot. It's not very long before we're in the shoes of Miku, who enters the mansion herself in search of her brother. Once you're in control, you'll notice plenty of staples of classic horror games. Fixed camera angles, dark corridors lit only by your flashlight, and level progression being a room-by-room -room venture. Many people will be very happy to know that Fatal Frame uses full analog control, which, as I always have to point out, is something that sort of clashes with fixed angles. This camera system was made with the tank controls of the PS1 era in mind, so when you tack full analog onto it, you can find yourself jittering and getting turned around between the cuts. But Fatal Frame offers a really interesting solution to this. Tank controls is an option, like in Silent Hill 2 and 3, but there's no strafe buttons and you can't walk backwards, so it's not really a good option. Instead, you're gonna want to stick with the analog controls because of what they did with the run button. Instead of simply being a toggle for which speed you want to move at while holding the stick, it'll make you run forward even when when you're not holding the stick. So it doubles as not just a run button like it usually would, but also a sort of replacement for a tank controlled fashioned up on the D-pad. So when you're changing angles, you can now hold the run button to continue straight without holding the stick in any direction to avoid discrepancies with the angle. Now it's not perfect, of course without the steering you might find the transition between certain angles to still be a tad clunky, but this is a much better solution than anything else I've played has come up with. Now the combat here is the real sell. While other horror games have you struggling to defend yourself with firearms or steel pipes, Fatal Frame has you taking photographs of the ghosts to seal them away. Ghosts don't die, after all. You've got to exercise them. As you explore the mansion, you'll occasionally bump into a ghost, and I really love how the cues were handled here. Silent Hill had that radio to let you know when something's nearby, which to this day is one of the most ingenious ways a horror game can create anticipation. Fatal Frame does something quite similar, but with much subtler cues that might take you a little bit longer to notice. As you're walking around, the music might change, and you'll feel very slight vibrations in the controller. But the music fades in so slowly that you might not even realize there's a ghost in the room until it's fairly close. It's not immediately evident. It's not a matter of, is the radio on or is the radio off? No, it's a matter of, wait, did the music change? I can't tell. Oh, wait, it did. Oh, I feel it. Yeah, here it comes. Pair that with the game's horrifying atmosphere, and it is probably the most tense I've felt in realizing there's an enemy in the room in a long time. Pressing the circle button will switch to a first-person perspective where we can locate the ghost. You can't just take pictures all willy-nilly, though. You'll have to keep the reticle on them as accurately as you can to charge up a shot before snapping the picture. Depending on the level of charge, you'll do a varying amount of damage to the ghost, and once its health bar is fully depleted, you'll then exercise it and it'll pose a threat to you no longer. This combat system is ingenious. I've always praised the Silent Hill games for striking a good balance with how vulnerable you are, you know, having weapons to defend yourself with, but they're short range, so you fall into that sensation of, please stay away from me, please stay away from me, as you try to fend them off without them getting too close. Fatal Frame gives a very similar sensation, scrambling as you scan the room, desperately trying to get the ghost back in view, so you can take that shot before it gets too close. It's like a reverse tug of war, but you don't even know where the rope is half the time. While in first person, you can also use the right stick to move your character, so you'll be able to very slowly back away to line up your shot which is brilliant because it creates those moments when your back hits a wall and you can't pack away any further. Oh man, they did an incredible job with the enemy design too. The ghosts are genuinely freaky as hell. A lot of them have very disturbing proportions or move in very inhuman ways, and when you turn the camera to see something like this right in your face, good lord, is it terrifying. I'm actually pretty happy to be able to say this, but I found this game pretty freaking scary. I feel like I don't get to say that often these days, because, I don't know, I think I just kind of spoiled myself having Silent Hill be the first horror franchise I ever played through, and also after playing so many horror games, I don't know, I kind of have a harder time getting scared by games these days. But Fatal Frame did it.
Fatal Frame is really good at scaring the player. It is a shining example of just how much more effective subtler cues and direct encounters can be over loud sounds, jump scares, and running away. Personally, I think it's scarier to be stuck in a room with something and struggle to keep it away from you than it is to just run away and hide from it. Like a gun in other horror games, your camera has a limited amount of film, so you gotta try to be careful and make every shot count. Though you can get, like, infinite reset stocks from save points, which I really didn't like. I think they should have hidden a lot more film throughout the mansion instead, and then not have this? Like, running low on film created way less tension than it would have if I wasn't able to just get more at any time for free. But I suppose without any melee methods of defense, if you did run out of film completely, you wouldn't be able to progress any further in the game, so I guess it's to mitigate that, if anything. Your camera can accept multiple types of film, too. Type 14, type Type 37 and Type 74. These all have varying degrees of power, so let's say a Type 14 is the pistol, 37 is the shotgun, and 74 is the rifle. I really couldn't help but to make those comparisons because they're all color coded like freaking ammo boxes usually are. <laughs> now, of course, it's only the Type 14 you'll get from save points, so while you will never run out of stock completely, you will still have to find and ration out your stronger film as best you can. You can also buy these upgrades for your camera with spirit points, which you'll get for defeating each ghost, but you can also find hidden ghosts and snap pictures of them too, and that gives you a huge incentive to explore around and view each environment through the lens of your camera. Man, that sort of reminds me of how you can take pictures of those ghosts in Metal Gear Solid. The camera upgrades range through a bunch of pretty basic stuff, like increasing the speed at which it charges, increasing the size of the reticle, and increasing the damage done by a charged up shot. But outside of just the numbers going up, there's also a handful of special abilities as well. Stuff like freezing a ghost in place, or preventing them from turning invisible, or knocking a ghost back away from you if it gets too close. These are all done with the L1 button, but you gotta be careful with them because just like taking photos, you have to actually land a hit for them to work, and when they're constantly turning invisible, you have to be quite careful to land an accurate shot. Using any one of these abilities will consume one spirit stone, which again is something you can find around the mansion, so you get those by exploring, but they're very sparse, so it's best to only use these abilities when you absolutely have to. Don't do what I did and just use them all the time, because by the end of the game I had none and I couldn't use these abilities anymore, and I really wish I didn't do that. Other items you can find include the typical healing items, but there's also these stone mirrors. These are practically one-ups. If you die with one of these in your possession, you'll automatically use it to refill your health. You can only carry one at a time though, which I thought was a little bit pointless. I mean, like every time I saw one I couldn't pick up, I would just go back and get it every time I used one, but I guess only being able to use it once per encounter does sort of make sense. On top of consumables, you'll also pick up a number of story items you'll need to solve a variety of puzzles. Now what would a horror game be without puzzles? Though I have to be honest, Fatal Frame's puzzles are kind of weak. Any puzzle involving needing to use an item, it never lets you connect the dots yourself. You'll never open the inventory and select what you think you need. Instead, interacting with something will just automatically do it for you so long as it's in your inventory. There was a bunch of these that I solved by total accident because I didn't even realize I had the thing I needed. It would have been so much nicer to let me sit there for a second and think, oh wait, I have a lighter, oh, I can probably use that here. No, instead, I walked up to a thing I didn't even know was a puzzle thing, I clicked on it, and it was like, yeah, you got the lighter, there you go, and I was like, oh, what? I, okay, all right. Other puzzles are just flat out annoying. There's way too freaking many of these sliding tile puzzles where you gotta get the corresponding stones into the right slots. Like, you, you remember these things, right? It's pretty much that, it just looks a little bit different. I did not like these at all. And there's a ton of them. And some puzzles seem like they're gonna be cool at first, but then you realize the solution is actually insultingly simple. This Buddha puzzle is probably the best example I have of this. There's a blood stain in the middle and each statue has a bit of blood on it. So I thought, oh, I'll arrange them in a way so it looks like they were all there when the blood splattered. You know, gotta line up the blood stains. But after several failed attempts, I was dumbfounded to realize it was as simple as the one with the blood at the top right goes at the top right. The one with the blood at the bottom left goes at the bottom left. The one with the blood at the top goes at the top. You see what I mean? It's so 
dumb. This one here, you have to defeat several ghosts that correspond with the side of the shrine thing, and you have to input the corresponding letter that shows up in their photograph. But you can just guess each one over and over until you get it. So what's even the point of this to begin with? The only puzzle I thought was kind of cool was this one here, where you have to interpret numbers from a scrap of paper and input them on this thing, which I initially assumed it was a clock. So, you know, 12, 1... Six? Wait, that doesn't make sense. You gotta find this scrap of paper here that translates these numbers for you, and then cross-referencing with this thing, you can then input the code, and that's kinda cool. But the thing here is, while it was cool the first time, the game reuses the same puzzle again and again and again, so each time I was like, oh, alright, time to scroll through my recent notes and find the highlighted red numbers and put them in this thing again. Puzzles aren't the only thing this game repeats either, it straight up reuses the levels too. The game is spread across three different chapters, but each each chapter still takes place in the same mansion. They just relock all of the doors and make you re-explore all of the same rooms again. Albeit in a different order and with a couple of new rooms each time, but it still really struck me as budgeted? I'm guessing they couldn't afford to make multiple levels so they reused the same one three times. And it's not like Resident Evil or Haunting Ground where it is on one property but you discover more and more of it. No, again, you really have to make your way through the exact same set of rooms multiple times. And I do applaud their efforts of making things as fresh and different as they possibly could upon multiple treks throughout the same area, but it is still undeniably quite repetitive. And I guess to make matters worse, I didn't really find the environments all that interesting. And I know it's not the setting itself, I have explored other games with thoroughly Japanese settings that I have been very interested in. I think it's the lack of set decoration. A lot of rooms sport the same colors, the same creaky wood, the same sorts of objects, the same overall look. It doesn't have that attention to detail that makes every room stand out as something unique, something that games like Haunting Ground have excelled at. As you explore the mansion, you'll uncover a lot of scraps and notes and stuff that slowly unveil the story. You'll discover what happened to the novelist and his crew, uncovering a curse that they all fell victim to. He's been saying something about more ropes since we took some photos yesterday. The Rope Curse. As they explored the mansion, they started to notice rope marks around their skin as if they were like strangled on their arms and legs, and then eventually each person is mysteriously found dead. It was actually pretty cool learning about this sort of thing in passing, and then getting to experience it ourselves. That wouldn't be nearly as terrifying if we didn't already explore the accounts of the curse's previous victims. Giving the curse itself a development arc before giving that curse to the player makes it that much more effective. Oh, these notes can be really freaking wordy though. The game just loves to dump tons and tons of text on you, and I found myself getting a little bit exhausted by it, and by extension, disinterested in the story at times. I actually thought I didn't really like the story that much at first, but thinking back on it, I think the story is totally fine, it's just how the game goes about unraveling it to you that I wasn't crazy about. So yeah, uh, spoilers I guess, I'll give a quick rundown of the plot and skip here if you would like to avoid that. Alright, so throughout the game, you'll continuously encounter this little ghost girl. This is the younger self of a shrine maiden named Kirie. As you continue through the game, you'll uncover a number of rituals that were conducted to decide the next shrine maiden. Firstly, we have the blinding ritual. One must be blinded with the blinding mask, which is this oni mask with two nails on the inside. You can pretty much imagine what comes next. <laughs> Next comes the demon tag ritual. The blinded maiden must play tag with a bunch of children. The last one caught is then chosen to become the next shrine maiden. This, of course, was Kirie, whose duty was to be part of the strangling ritual, being tied down and sacrificed to keep the hellgate closed. This locks away evil spirits so they can't haunt the world of the living. However, Kirie ended up falling in love with somebody before being part of the strangling ritual, so she wasn't able to pass into the afterlife properly as she still had desires in and connected with the world of the living. So the hell gate wasn't properly closed and evil spirits began to haunt the mansion, including that of Kirie herself. So of course, this is what incited the rope curse, the failing of this strangling ritual. So Miku's gotta figure out a way to bring peace to Kirie so she can pass on properly, finish the ritual, and get rid of the evil spirits. The solution is sorta messed up though, like you finally find Mafuyu, but it turns out he kinda looks like the guy that Kirie was in love with, so he just decides to spend eternity with her, outright sacrificing himself to seal up the Hellgate. I must stay. 
dude, that's like none of your business. Like, you don't have to do this just because you kind of maybe sort of look like the guy. <laughs> Good lord. But yeah, that's pretty much the gist of the plot. Uh, I know I did brush over some details, like the camera's importance and its connection to the main character and, of course, her mother, but I gotta be brutally honest, I don't really remember all of that. I feel like a lot of those details went in one ear and out the other, because I think this game tries to develop too many subplots at once, which makes them a little bit harder to keep track of, especially with how so much of that is just through text and text and text. Though, I did really, really like how it develops each individual ritual in its own confined space before having you link them all together, and then you realize how they contribute to the fate of the main villain, Ghost Kitty, but... Man, I just found it really easy to get lost in how freaking wordy this game is. I really love it when horror games show you a bunch of events and make you piece it all together yourself, but when there's this much text hammering in every little non-consequential detail, I find it long-winded and much less interesting than it could have been if the story were streamlined. Again, it's not a bad story, it's really not. In the end, I thought it was actually pretty good. It's just the storytelling I think could use some fine-tuning. Man, I am all over the place with this game. Like, I do think its strengths are really strong, but anything else, I'm kind of whatever about. I found the storytelling quite cluttered, I didn't really find the mansion all that interesting to explore, and the puzzles, I found them either annoying, too simple, or just flat out boring. But the atmosphere and the enemy design are really freaking good, and the gameplay is superb, the combat especially. I'd say the positives most certainly outweigh the negatives, but even still, there's a lot of room for improvement here, which is exciting because this is just the first game and what's a pretty chunky series. So next time, we're going to check out Fatal Frame 2 and see how that one fares. I'll see you guys then.